Good morning, booktube, youtube, this is Johnny, time to make a video, it's been a couple days, it's a new week, we're in the middle of the month of May, uh, it is May the 15th, 2022, it is 9, 10 in the morning, it is a Sunday, and it is not hot today, today since I think it's 69 degrees and it's gray and cloudy out and I looked at the weather for this week and it's all going to be in the 60s and we had last week that really hot spell in the 80s hit the 90s not this week we're back to normal May weather and yeah this morning my wife has gone to church my wife goes early to set up for coffee and that for Sunday school. Today's the last Sunday school for, and then they don't have Sunday school during the summer. So she set up for coffee and I'm writing in my diaries. I do in the mornings. It's, it's like I, I, you know, I do the same thing every day. My goal these days is get through the morning get through the afternoon, get through the evening, and get through the night. And I don't try to think ahead. I don't try to live in the past. Just get through this day. So I am on page, well I already did a page for my diary. And now I'm on page 469 for the year 2022. Start at my second page for this day. So yeah, we're in the middle of the month. So as you all know, I have two folders. The first folder is from the first of the month into the 15th. And then the second folder is from the 16th until the end of the month, which will be on a Tuesday, the 31st, will be the end of May, and then we go into June. My wife will come back from Denver on the 30th. She's going to visit our daughter, Bethany, and her husband Andy and our grandchildren Louisa, Margaret, Jack, and little Nora, Jean. And uh, so yeah, the second full. So tomorrow I can put May 16th in here. And this will go in here this morning. So yeah, so I'm, I'm doing okay. I mean, every morning when I wake up, the first thing I do is I kind of check my temperature my psychological state, my emotional state, my intellectual state, my spiritual state. I'm, I'm very introspective. <laughs> I'm a, I live inside my mind. I don't really like going any, anywhere physically. I'm all mind. I'm all into my mind, into thinking and reading and writing and uh, so the point is, I'm doing okay today. I've been a little anxious, and I think it's because my wife will be gone. She leaves next Saturday, and I think I get a little uneasy about it because I like my wife being around. <laughs> but what, uh, what I decided to do is I mentioned of doing a book report. And that's been kind of a new experience. And just before I start making this video, I, I was thinking, okay, why did I start making videos in book two? And, and my, initial, uh, my initial reason was that I'm a book collector. So the idea was that I would show you the books that I collect. And then the, but the, one of the primary reasons is that when I started watching book two, five, six years ago, I didn't see anybody talking about Christian books. And since I'm a Christian, this coming August, I've been a Christian 52 years. The Lord saved me the summer of 1970 when I lived in Richmond, California. And I 
was in the Jesus movement there in the Bay Area, Berkeley and Richmond. And I joined a Baptist church, American Baptist church when I was, the Lord saved me. But the point is, is I didn't see anybody making, talking about Christian books. And so I thought since I'm a Christian and I'm a Christian bookworm, not only do I read secular books, art, history, music, letters, memoirs, autobiographies, I read Christian literature. And like in the mornings, I've been reading Looking Unto Jesus by Isaac Ambrose. Uh, the full title is, uh, is Looking Unto Jesus. Now this is a Puritan reprint. This is published first in the 17th century. But Looking Unto Jesus, A View of the Everlasting Gospel or the Soul's Eyeing of Jesus as Carrying on the Great Work of Man's Salvation from First to Last by Isaac Ambrose. And this was a reprint in 1986. I bought this when we were living in Houston, Texas. So I've been reading this along with... I've been showing... This is the fourth volume, final volume of The Life of Jesus Christ by Rudolph of Saxony. This is part two, volume two, chapters 58 to 89. And this whole volume is is focused on the last week of Jesus. It, well, up to, is basically his passion. Uh, I think on Friday and then Good Friday, the Holy Week, and then it goes into his resurrection and the Day of Judgment. So I've been reading that, and I also have been reading a more modern work, Jesus in Jerusalem, The Last Days by Eckhart Chabelle. And then I've been reading uh, Herman Bavick on Christology, uh, Christ Humiliation, The Person of Christ, The Work of Christ, uh, His Humiliation, and then I was reading his exaltation, and then it goes into uh, the order of salvation. So I've been reading that. So these are the kind of books I first, when I start making booktube videos, is to show you, read Herman Bavick. <laughs> He's a good Christian literature. This is good Christian literature. Jerusalem, Jesus and Jerusalem, The Last Days by... Eckhard Chabel, Chabel, and Rudolf of Saxony, and Isaac Ambrose, as you know, is one of my favorite books. I've been reading this going on 30 years. <laughs> so that's why I started making booktube, to show you what good Christian literature. There's a lot of Christian literature out there, but these are the ones I think are worth reading. So... The point is, is I was mentioning I was going to do a book report on this book. I just finished reading this uh, last week, Love's Attraction by David Adams Cleveland. And so I said I was going to do a book report and that I found a form that I was going to follow. And the form is book title, author, publisher, number of pages, Fiction or genre, uh, nonfiction, subject, how I discovered or acquired this book, etc., etc. So I was going to use this form to do a book report. And so I did a, so my first, I, I did a book report about a year ago, maybe two years ago, and I used this form. And it was okay, and I got some positive comments. So then I decided to try again, see if I could do it. And to be honest, I didn't really, I don't really like doing book reports, I think, because I just don't feel comfortable about doing book reports, but I thought I'd try. Uh, because I want you to know that I do read novels and I do finish them. I just don't flash them up here in a video and that's it. I mean, now I do collect a, novel, a lot of novels down the lower level in the library. I have oh, probably 3,000 novels. 
cataloged in my library thing and I'm always getting novels and I'm always looking at novels and fiction. I got stuff coming in the mail. <laughs> but anyway, so the point is I'm not sure if I will continue to do book reports on a routine basis. Now once in a while I might do a book report. But since I did this book report on Love's Attraction, I'm going to do it so I can get it off my mind, scratch it off my to-do list, and go on. So, here it goes. The title of this is Love's Attraction. Author is David Adams Cleveland. Now, I, these are all information I got from the internet. David Adams Cleveland is a novelist and art historian. In his previous novel, Time's Betrayal was awarded Best Historical Novel by 2000, um, 2017 by Reading the Past. Um, and then he did his second novel, he wrote the summer of 2014, Love's Attraction became a top-selling hardback fiction for Barnes & Nobles in New England. And the reason why I think it in New England is that the, the novel Love's Attraction, when it opens up the first part of the book, it's situated in Concord, Massachusetts. And uh, the character Michael Collins, he's on the run and he takes on the false identity of a Walden scholar, a scholar on the transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau. And so then it goes on here. A publisher who published this book was Weisted Press, which I never heard of. And it was published in 2013. And my copy is a signed copy. It was for Vicky with best wishes and joy, David A. Cleveland 6714. Let's see, it's a signed copy. I got this used. Number of pages, four, 543 pages. Now, I suppose you could say it's historical fiction because it deals with, but I would say it's more fiction. It's kind of hard to label it. Uh, but it does go into the, the second part of the novel situ, situated in Venice, Italy and it goes into the artistic community of Venice, Italy before the First World War. It goes into the lives of the painters who were there like Whistler and Sargent. So then it, the question that, that asked me, how did I discover or acquire this book? Well, I was watching a booktube video and someone, uh, David Adams Cleveland, just his new novel just came out called Gods of Deception. And I thought about ordering it and getting it, but then I noticed this book. And what attracted to me was that it, it mentioned that about American transcendentalism in Henry David Thoreau and it mentioned uh, Whistler the painter in Venice and so that's why I got this. So then the question is uh, when and where I read? Well I started reading this back in March and I just finished it March 2022. Noteworthy experience while reading this book. I had no noteworthy experience in reading this novel. I did enjoy Cleveland's insights into the painting styles of singer Sargent and Whistler. I also enjoyed the parts of the novel that took place in Venice, Italy around the turn of the century. And then I have check out these books <coughs> on Venice, Italy. Venice Observed by Mary McCarthy. Vidal in Venice by Gord Vidal. Photographs by Tor Gill. Check out authors' other books or related books. Uh, so like I said, I, I still might in the future order his book Gods of Deception because it takes place during the American Cold War which interests me. Uh, 
rate on a scale of 1 to 10. I don't really rate books. I mean, to me, it's kind of artificial how you rate a book from 1 to 10. But um, I did like the novel, and I don't, I don't think it was a bad read. I don't think it was a waste of my time. I did find it interesting. I kept reading it. I did finish it. As you know, I don't really finish that many novels I start. So it did, I was interested enough to, and, and uh, found it somewhat enjoy, enjoyable. So I read it to the end because I wanted to find out the ending. Quality of writing. Uh, I think the writing in here, it's more, it's not literary fiction. It's kind of more, like I've said, you, you read novelists and they take certain ideas or certain subject matter and they use the characters to set forth their ideas, the writer's ideas about in this case, uh, 19th century painting, uh, artistic community in Venice, Italy, before the turn of the century, uh, American transcendentalism, Walden, Concord, Massachusetts. So the writing was, uh, the man who wrote this, it's very well written and constructed. The novel is, is, uh, is well constructed. It has a certain thickness. It's it's intellectually interesting. Uh, the writing is not clumsy or boring. It's it's I suppose somewhat stimulating. <laughs> pace. I do not know if there was a pace to this novel. It, to me, it's more like a a flat surface. It just you just read along and and. Uh, it didn't slow down. I didn't get bogged down. I didn't get bored. I don't like that word bored. I, I never get bored, but it was okay. There was a certain mystery that kept you going, which you have to read the novel to know what the mystery is. It goes into... There's a... In the novel, the major character, Michael Collins, finds out that this love interest he had when he was in... Uh, like some kind of Ivy League prep school that she has been reported committing committed suicide. But then you begin but then he begins to question because this girl that he was in love with, her name is Sarah Palmer, uh, she had an identical sister named Angela. And so you're wondering did Angela commit suicide or did Sarah commit suicide? It was, and that's what kind of drives you along in the novel as you go through it. Who actually did they find dead? Was it Sarah or Angela? Because they're identical twins. Uh, plot development. I do not see a plot in the novel. There was a mystery concerning identity, which I just mentioned. Uh, I did not think that I knew what the ending would be, but when I came to the end of the novel, I found myself confused. I still don't really know about the identity of the person who they found dead. Was it Angela or Sarah? I don't really still know. The main characters of the novel, characters. Uh, like I said, the characters didn't really stand out the identities, character development. It was more the ideas, the mystery of identity and things like that. Uh, I think Cleveland purposely made the characters of the novel not solid, but fluid. Enjoyability. I did find this novel interesting, but I would not describe the novel as being enjoyable. The novel was more, for me, intellectually enjoyable at times. Uh, ins insightfulness. I did not gain any insights from reading this novel. No, it wasn't. Ease of reading. The writing style was not difficult. The prose of the novel was not thick or confusing. Recommend this book. I would recommend this book if you like a love story, an intellectual romance, if you're into Venice, Italy, 
if you're into art, if you're into American transcendentalism, if you're into uh, an interesting story, yeah, I recommend it. So, yeah, plot, basic plot or content setting, main character point of view, how this book made you feel or what it might think, great lines or quotes. I don't have anything here about that. Now, I did, at the bottom of this review, I have what the novel is described in Amazon. It says, from, the li from literary conquer to the backwater caught canals of Venice, love's attraction takes readers on a tantalizing and thought-provoking journey as Michael Collins, a Washington political fixer facing impending bribery scandal, is suddenly confronted with a past he never knew and a legacy of heartbreak and deception and from which he failed to escape. Michael Collins is returning to Lowell, the derelict mill city of his childhood, the funeral of his estranged brother. Driving a Route 128, he finds himself compelled to stop in nearby Concord at Emerson Academy, where his precocious youth as a talented pianist and dreams of a rowing scholarship to Harvard ended in devastating scandal. In his senior year, he, the Lowell boy, fell deeply in love with a winsome Sarah Palmer, a blue blood Yankee from an illustrious Concord family who inexplicably betrayed him, a bitter expulsion that led down a path that finds regretting each day. As Michael revisits the scenes of their love affair 20 years later, Sandra's forthright integrity, the passionate and sensitive artist he remembers, shines forth and their wretching breakup makes less and less sense. Leaving the Lowell Cemetery in the following day, Michael is almost run down by a red pickup truck, perhaps a warning to keep his mouth shut in the coming grand jury investigation. Michael decides to disappear by disguising himself as a Thoreau scholar, hiding out in plain sight at Concord, historical Concord Inn. From this oddly liberating vantage point, the life he never had, he discovers the shocking news of Sandra Palmer's recent suicide at, at Harvard, made even more troubling when he learns that Sandra had a twin sister, Helter Skelter Angela Palmer, 70s radical and 80s porn star, internet intrepidor, and seemingly disappeared around the same time as his sister's senseless suicide. With the FBI closing in Michael's investigation to Sarah Palmer's untimely Death transform an odyssey of discovery about her family, glittering if troubled past, a search for love and redemption that will finally draw back to his own family roots in Venice. And the Venice of 1914 is limed in the diary of Sarah's grandfather, the once famous painter, friend to singer, sergeant, and whistler, Joseph Palmer, where yet another tale of deceit and obsession unfolds about the artist, pianist's wife, and model Sarah Palmer's namesake, who befriended a poor Venetian stonecutter in months before World War I. The tragedy of this talented woman's death, she played Beethoven, Boston Symphony Hall at 16, created the world that the young Michael and Sarah unwittingly inherited. Love Attraction is a mysterious romantic novel that explores the universal themes of identity how memory or its lack, talented and temperate desires embodied in art as well as in our genes are passed down from through, through families to influence our hidden selves. The novel speaks to a role of metaphorsis in our lives and how the transforming elixir of love's attraction makes us most fully human. So that's how Amazon described it. So you can see you can check it out. It was, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I think it was interesting. So I just thought I'd do the book review, even though I did it. You can read this on my, in my online diary, Crooked Fingers. I have it posted there. So you can see why I don't do book reports. I'm just terrible at them. <laughs> so I hope you're having, you'll have a good new reading week. I have, Tons of thrift store books, books from the book nook, 
books I got in the mail. I'll do a future video on that. So I hope you have a good Sunday, a good week, and until next time, bye.